brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that supports life and family. 5% of your monthly plan price goes to your favorite charity. Buy the way you believe at CharityMobile.com and use promo code TRADITION. From time to time, I like to bring something to your attention from Archbishop Lefebvre. He's kind of a hot device, not divisive, I would not call him, but uh, one who people are very divisive about, figure in the church. Up front, I'll tell you that uh, while I don't typically go to Mass with the SSPX, I have a few times, and I tend to think Archbishop Lefebvre is a hero of the faith. I also tend to think that the uh, FSSP, I completely understand why their priests could not go along with his or his consecration of bishops. I completely understand it, although I do think he was justified in doing it. The SSPX versus other priestly fraternities question is, I think, one mostly for the bishops to work out among themselves. But I can see all sides of it and why various factions came to the decisions they did make. I tend to be very pro-traditional priestly fraternity, regardless of which one it is, to be upfront about this. Today, I have for you Archbishop Lefebvre giving us the, showing us where synodality came from, which it, it does come from Vatican II. You will never hear him say the word synodal or synodality here, because that word wasn't really used at all. In fact, he never even mentions synods, which were actually ongoing at that time that he gave this, which was 1984. Here he's talking about the Code of Canon Law, how it was changed, and the spirit behind that change and others. And that spirit of change behind it is man-centeredness, which he traces directly with quotations from the documents of Vatican II. This is important because synodality is the ultimate manifestation of this man-centered reorientation of the church. Previous to synodality, it was the change in the mass, which became very man-centered. Synodality ramps it up to 11 and makes no mistake about the new orientation of the church. Here, I hope Archbishop Lefebvre will make this more clear for you so you can understand how this applies to the state of the church today. I want to speak to you of a very serious novelty, the new code of canon law. I had not seen any necessity for a change, but if the law changes, the law changes, and we must make use of it, for the church can ask nothing evil from her faithful. However, when one reads this new code of canon law, one discovers an entirely new conception of the church. It is easy to be aware of, since John Paul II himself describes it in the Apostolic Constitution, which introduces the new code. Quote, It follows that which constitutes the fundamental novelty of Vatican Council II, in full continuity with the legislative tradition of the church, this is to deceive, especially in that which concerns ecclesiology, constitutes also the novelty of the new code. Hence, the novelty of the conception of the Church according to the Council is equally the novelty of the conception of the new Code of Canon Law. What is this novelty? It is that there is no longer any difference between the clergy and the laity. There is now just the faithful, nothing else, on account of the, quote, doctrine according to which all members of the people of God, according to the mode which is proper to each, partake in the triple priestly, prophetic, and royal function of Jesus Christ. To this doctrine is likewise attached that which concerns the duties and rights of the faithful, and particularly the laity, and finally the church's involvement in ecumenism. This is the definition of the church from Canon 204. Quote, The faithful are those who, inasmuch as they are incorporated in Christ by baptism, are constituted as the people of God, and for this reason, having been made partakers in their manner in the priestly, prophetic, and royal functions of Christ, are called to exercise the mission that God entrusted to the church to accomplish in the world. We are all faithful members of the people of God, and we all therefore have ministries. It is clearly said in the Code, all the faithful have ministries. They therefore all have the responsibility to teach, to sanctify, and even to direct. Let us continue our commentary on this Canon 204. Quote, Having been made partakers in their manner in the priestly, prophetic, and royal function of Christ, they are called to exercise the mission which God entrusted to the church to accomplish in the world, according to the juridical condition proper to each one. Hence, everyone without exception, without distinction between clergy and laity, inasmuch as they are the people of God, has the responsibility of this mission entrusted by Jesus Christ properly to the church. There is no longer any clergy. What then happens to the clergy? It is as if they said that it is no longer parents who have the responsibility to give life to children, but the family, or rather, all the members of the family, parents and children. This is exactly the same thing as saying today that bishops, priests, and laymen have all the responsibility for the mission of the church. But who gives the graces to become a Catholic? How does one become faithful? 
No one knows anymore who has the responsibility for what. It is consequently easy to understand that this is the ruin of the priesthood and the laicization of the church. Everything is oriented towards the layman, and little by little the sacred ministers disappear. The minor orders and the subdiaconate have already disappeared. Now there are married deacons, and little by little laymen take over the ministry of the priests. This is precisely what Luther and the Protestants did, laicizing the priesthood. It is consequently very serious. This is quite openly explained in an article in the Osservator Romano of March 17, 1984. Quote, The role of the laity in the new code. The active function in th that the laity has been called on to exercise since Vatican II by participating in the condition and mission of the entire church according to the particular vocation is a doctrine, which in the context of the appearance of the concept of the people of God has brought about a reevaluation of the laity as much in the foundation of the church as for the active role they are called on to develop in the building up of the church, end quote. Such is the inspiration of the whole new code of canon law. Is this definition of the church which is the poison which infects the new laws? The same can be said for the liturgy. There is a relationship between this new code of canon law and the entire liturgical reform, as Bugnini said in his book, The Fundamental Princi Principles of the Changing of the Liturgy. Quoting Bugnini, the path opened by the council is destined to change radically the traditional liturgical assembly, in which, according to a custom dating back many centuries, the liturgical service is almost exclusively accomplished by the, liter by the clergy. The people assist, but too much as a stranger and as a dumb spectator. End quote. What? How can one dare say that the faithful are present at the sacrifice of the Mass as simply dumb spectators so as to change the liturgy? How must the faithful be active in the sacrifice of the Mass? By the body or spiritually? Obviously spiritually. One can draw a spiritual profit from assisting at Mass in silence. It is in fact a mystery of our faith. How many have become saints in the silence of the true Mass? Quote, A long education will be necessary for the liturgy to become an action of all the people of God. Again, Bugnini. Without a doubt. Then he adds that he is speaking of, quote, a substantial unity, but not a uniformity. You must realize that this is a true break with the past. And quoting Bugnini. This past is the 20 centuries of prayer of the Church. Bugnini was the key man in the liturgical reform. I went to see Cardinal Cucogiani when this reform was published, and I asked him, said to him, quote, Your Eminence, I am not in agreement with this change. The Mass no longer has its mystical divine character. To which he replied, Excellency, it is like that. Bugnini can enter as he likes into the Pope's office to make him sign what he wants. This is what happened to the Secretariat of State. This is how all these changes happened. They agreed on it beforehand, and then obtained signatures for some changes, and then others, and then others. I said to Cardinal Gutt, quote, Your Eminence, you are responsible for divine worship, and you accord permission for the Blessed Sacrament to be received in the hand. They will know that this was published with the agreement of the Prefect for the Congregation for Divine Worship. To which he replied, Excellency, I do not even know if I will be asked for it to be done. You know, it is not I who command. The boss is Bugnini. If the Pope asks me what I think of communion in the hand, I will cast myself on my knees before him to ask him not to do it. You see, then, how things happened in Rome. A simple signature on the bottom of a decree in the church is ruined by numerous sacrileges. The real presence of our Lord is ruined, for it is no longer respected. Then nothing sacred remains, as was seen at the large reunion at which the Pope was present, where the Blessed Sacrament was passed around from hand to hand between thousands of persons. Nobody genuflects anymore before the Blessed Sacrament. How can they still believe that God is present there? It is the same spirit which inspired the changes of the canon law as what is that which inspired the changes in the liturgy. It is the people of God, the assembly, which does everything. The same applies to the priest. He is a simple president who has a ministry, as others have a ministry, in the midst of an assembly. Our orientation towards God has likewise disappeared. This comes from the Protestants who say that Eucharistic devotion, for them there is neither mass nor sacrifice, this would be blasphemy, is simply a movement of God towards man, but not of man towards God to render him glory, which is nevertheless the first end of the liturgy. This new state of liturgical mind comes likewise from Vatican II. Everything is for man. The bishops and priests are at the service of man and the assembly. But where is God then? And what is his glory sought? What will we do in heaven? For in heaven all is the glory of God, which is exactly what we ought to do here on earth. But the, all that is done away with and replaced by man. This is truly the ruin of all Catholic thought. You know that the new code of canon law permits a priest to give communion to a Protestant. It is what they call Eucharistic hospitality. These are Protestants who remain Protestants and do not convert. This is directly opposed to the faith. 
For the sacrament of the Eucharist is precisely the sacrament of the unity of the faith. To give communion to a Protestant is to rupture the faith and its unity. Archbishop Lefebvre hit a lot of different points in that talk, but you kind of see that his underlying point is the spirit of all of this. And so now, as I said in the intro, let's bring this back to synodality. Synodality is the logical conclusion of this. As I've tried to communicate many times to people over the past, synodality didn't come out of anywhere. It didn't come out of nowhere. Pope Francis isn't the problem. He is the manifestation of the perfection of the problem, the continuing development of it since the late 1950s. They have admitted that they are trying to build a new church. They have said as much. That's why the way of worship that developed organically from apostolic times until 1962 was apparently no longer okay or fitting with the theology of the church. They have said that. It's a fancy way of saying it's a new religion. And for those of you who might be from uh, the Eastern rites of the Catholic Church watching this, after they're done with us, and the, us Latins, they will come for you. That is inevitable. But Archbishop Lefebvre here connects all the dots, which is very, very badly needed. It's not just the Code of Canon Law. It's not just the Mass. It's everything. And it's the influence of certain very high-profile heretics who can bypass the traditional mechanisms of power to get the influence that they need for the outcomes they want directly from the Roman pontiff. How much worse do you think it is now under Francis, where he controls all the mechanisms of checks and balances in the Roman Curia? They're all his men now. So he can just delegate the changes he wants to see. Remember, the fiducia supplicants issue, the blessings for James Martin types and their relationships, rather explicitly said in that document, no matter what some grifter on social media might tell you, that was supposed to be picked up by the Synod. But instead, Pope Francis said Cardinal Fernandez read a document, giving him the outcome he wanted. Will we see something similar in the coming days on women's ordination? I'll let you ponder that one. Thinking about what Archbishop Lefebvre said here about the orientation of the church towards man now. Let me know what you think of this in the comments, please. Hit like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help. So does sharing this on social media. That helps too. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.